Tata Motors. Mr. Rohan Rao, Program Manager, Electric and Hydrogen Mobility, WRI India. Dr. Gunja Munjal, Program Manager, Hydrogen, WRI India. And Mr. Pavan Malukutla, who is our Director, Clean Mobility and Energy Tech. Uh, so Mr. Malukutla will also be moderating today's session. I welcome you all once again, and we are very delighted that you all could join us for this webinar. I would request Mr. Pavan Mulukutla now to please launch and introduce the Hydrogen TCO bus evaluator now. Over to you, Pavan. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, that's the launch of our Hydrogen bus. virtual launch and this is hosted on our website and um, happy that you all can download register yourself and download the evaluator i think that's the process right rohan yeah and um, we are um, what i would say is that this is going to be extremely useful in getting inputs from all of you for the evaluator itself and uh, we have come up with certain assumptions and certain pricing based upon our own market research, but happy to hear from all of you. If you have alternative numbers, um, you can play around with your um, play around with the tool and get back to us, letting us know um, your suggestions and we're happy to tweak. But the whole um, basis for putting this out today was also that I think there's a lot of unknown things in the way we look at uh, the hydrogen. And um, we have been talking about electric buses uh, so far, and now we are talking suddenly about the hydrogen buses with few states um, showing interest to deploy also. So we thought this is an appropriate uh, time to really start talking in terms of the financial implications that will have and what kind of policy measures would really be then required to take this forward. So I think the latter part of the discussion today will also focus on not just the technological elements of you know, the hydrogen fuel cell bus, but also on what kind of policy measures that could be needed, what kind of subsidies are we really talking about? And how, where do we see the uh, future of hydrogen fuel cell buses in India specifically in terms of how it would move forward? So what we would do is that we will do a short demo. That's the plan, right, Anandita? That do a demo of the, TCO uh, by my colleague Rohan, who would walk us through um, what have been the assumptions, what have been the parameters you have taken into consideration. And then we'll open up for a moderated discussion with uh, Professor Gita, with uh, Mr. Rahul Kataria, and Mr. Chincholkar from KPIT. And then we'll take QA from the audience as well. So, with that, um, either Rohan, Anand, back to you guys. I'll take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pawan. Uh, so I'll just uh, share my screen and give a, a brief demonstration of how it can be downloaded, how we can play around. So uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the, the Hydrogen uh, Bus TCO Evaluator launch. Uh, so let's just share my screen. Uh, are you able to see this? Yeah, Rohan, we can see the right. screen. Great. So you can just go to our uh, WRI India website and uh, then go to what we do and topics and our new initiatives is hydrogen. Uh, so you can read a bit about our work and research pertaining to hydrogen. It's an enabler for you know, cross-sectoral decarbonization and all the, the research and the videos and events here. At the end, we also have the certain projects that you can click on the hydrogen uh, TCO evaluator. And then uh, you know you can click on download the evaluator and you'll get our uh, the TCO evaluator itself, right? Uh, so uh, let me just uh, run through the uh, evaluator. Uh, so if you can see my screen now, yeah. Uh, so uh, here the TCO evaluator uh, generally basically has the three main uh, sheets. Uh, the first sheet would be. Just sorry to interrupt. If you, you'll have to zoom in while explaining in the Excel. Yeah. Just yeah. will do. Thank you. Is it is it better now? Okay. Uh, so yeah. So the, the the three main sheets here. One is the instructions itself, how to use this dynamic uh, cost of ownership dashboard. Uh, the, the ones uh, in colored green can be edited, and you can add your own uh, values. And the one in gray are fixed and that cannot be edited. So it also gives you what are the functions, what are the actions required and so forth. 
the second one the one here is the the heart of the evaluator itself so this has uh, all the green cells which can be changed and the the changes can be seen on this uh, dynamic dashboard uh, which i will uh, go in detail in a, in a few minutes the the last one is of course the summary this summary sheets kind of gives you a complete overview of whatever you inputted the back end calculations and then kind of gives you the final uh, total cost of ownership throughout the lifetime of the bus itself so i'll just uh, uh, quickly share uh, uh, what are the different components that goes into this uh, hydrogen uh, bus tcu evaluator so here it's again it's it's broken up into two components this is the this part is the input component where you can add the different uh, travel details and this is the basically the out, output component this is a dynamic dashboard it will showcase whatever changes have been uh, done in the input and the output is just thrown right so the first one is the vehicle holding period you can change it to whatever uh, uh, you know you want to look at uh, year 14 year 15 and then it will show the concordant changes of the tcu at that specific year and of course you can add what will be the daily distance travel the vehicle utilization itself right from you know intracity where it can travel 250 kilometers per day then you can see you know the tco per kilometer and you keep on increasing it to 300 kilometers you see a change on here and then you see like you know in intercity or interstate if you travel 500 kilometers per day what could be the effect of the total cost of operation ownership on these kind of buses of all the variants and this also breaks down into what is the component cost which is like you know 86% of the fixed cost what is the percentage on variable costs and then you can also see its effect over the uh, period of utilization that's with the vehicle components the other one is of course the capital cost itself so this this portion is broken down into capex the capital expenditure component and the operational expenses right so we have also provided uh, the opportunity to change the currencies so you can see you can input your values in INR, the indian rupees you can change the dollars and it will change it to the concordant uh, uh, values and of course to the miles and everything and you can also change it to the euros so for the international markets also they can do a cost uh, verification of what would be the cost of you know a hydrogen uh, uh, vehicle running on a gray hydrogen and an electric bus and a diesel bus right so currently i'll just go back to the INR component and you can see it comes back to rupees per kilometer and the, all of these can be changed so currently we're Oh, and, and firstly, these, these numbers are just representative and like Pawan alluded to, these are the numbers that we have taken based on certain one-on-one -on -one conversations with, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, many uh, uh, industry experts, leaders, and also certain uh, uh, literature review that they've done. So currently, if it's five crores, you can all, all, always change it. If you feel it's three and a half crores, you can change it and you can see that, you know, the number changes here. It, it drops down by a certain amount. If you th think that the electric buses, it's more than three or two crores and goes over three crores you can change it so all of these numbers can be changed and uh, all the uh, users can play around with these numbers and also there are certain financial incentives that the government of india under fame to provides so for for example an e-bus with 280 kilowatt hour battery component you get up to 50 lakhs of incentive so if you input that number you can see that the the tco again drops if you have it for 350 it makes more sense so you can see if you remove that it's around 54 rupees and you add the incentive it drops by six rupees per kilometer so you can play around with this and also look at could there be any policy levers that the government of india can utilize and what if they were to provide equivalent say 50 lakh rupees as incentives so you can see that the uh, rupees per kilometer in hydrogen green uh, uh, vehicles also drops similarly you can add on to the other capital intensive costs of how many battery or a fuel stack replacements that would be required over the 15 or 10 years utilization period of the buses so currently we've said two what happens if there are three changes right then you know again it uh, changes from 130 to 141 rupees right what happens if uh, the battery has to be changed four times then you know six rupees per kilometer changes there and again uh, the fuel cell components uh, currently we're saying that you know it costs around 1500 dollars uh, uh, per kilowatt hour for a fuel cell stack what happens in the next few years it drops down to 850 dollars you know it drop uh, the cost drops down what happens if it drops to 850 so these are the kinds of uh, like you know changes or the inputs that can be that this uh, tcu evaluator can take and the people can utilize this and again the other components are of course the resale rates at the end of uh, the 10 or 15 years what will be the kind of resale rate again the financing component also plays a huge role 
because a five crore uh, vehicle purchase cost, no one is you know putting uh, the whole money into an individual bus. So there'll be some amount of equity and interest rate. So what happens if the interest rates goes up, right? Then your, your TCO increases. What happens if there's aggressive pricing and reduces? So you can see that TCO drops. So all of these, this uh, uh, TCO evaluator takes into account the different components of capital intensive uh, inputs. And of course, the operational expenses, which are you know the recurring costs. What is the cost per uh, staff cost per month? So you say it's 50,000. What happens if it is, let's just zoom a bit. What happens if it's 132 now? What happens if the staff cost increases you know, to one lakh, right? Uh, so, so you, you can see that the increase across all variants because it's a recurring cost. The operational expense is a recurring cost. What happens if uh, if the fuel uh, cost currently we're assuming it to be rupees one eighty uh, uh, rupees one eighty per kg for a grey hydrogen? What happens if it drops to one dollar? Right? Uh, what happens if the green hydrogen drops to say two dollars? So you can see a significant drop in the from one hundred and seven uh, one hundred twenty five one forty drops to one eighty. Right? Uh, so, and then of course, the mileage quantity, if it's 15 kilometers per kg, and currently it's 118, what happens if the mileage increases? You can see it drops down, so like you know, around two rupees per kilometer and similar. And uh, again, the annual maintenance cost can be checked out based on uh, the real world applications. Currently diesel might have a bit more uh, annual maintenance cost, where the electric buses might have minimum moving components, hence, Hence, they might have less maintenance cost. So all of these, all of these different moving parts have been taken into account. So I would, uh, I would uh, recommend, encourage everyone, all of our uh, attendees today, to go to our website, download the RPC evaluator, and pair on with the numbers, input their own values, and try to like you know develop different models on when cost parity will reach. And uh, we'll be very happy to get your feedback also on this. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I'll, I'll put it back to Anand. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rohan. Uh, I hope uh, everybody was able to uh, get a glimpse of our uh, evaluator. Uh, and now I request Pawan to start the moderating uh, the session where we'll be taking questions from the attendees as well. Over to you, Pawan. So thank you. Um, but I just wanted to start um, with Mr. Chincholkar uh, G from KPIT um, that no, um, you all have, um, I don't know if you had a chance to see the numbers that Rohan was talking about, but I just wanted to understand um, two aspects. One is um, we clearly see, I mean, I know last month you all uh, also developed an indigenous bus on hydrogen fuel cell, and we're talking about this technology transition in India with EVs already and with hydrogen. My first question is, um, where do we see the potential of hydrogen fuel cell based buses in India in terms of you know uh, the route choices and their application and then I'll come back to the um, cost uh, parameters um, shortly on that but uh, just your initial reactions around that. You are on mute Mr. Yeah. Chin -chin. Sorry, sorry, my phone. Good afternoon all. India currently has uh, you know, around 20 lakh uh, buses. If you take about, you know, because we launched the bus last month and it was a nine meter bus. So India currently has around 20 lakh buses out of which uh, almost nine lakh buses are intercity buses. Six lakh are corporate and, uh, you know, balance are all uh, STEC tube plus uh, school buses. So if you look at uh, intercity applications uh, with around uh, 400 kilometers per day running, I think that is an area where nine meter and 12 meter can actually fit in very well. And uh, at a certain price point for the hydrogen as well as the bus price point, uh, we should definitely be able to match our BGTC for diesel. So we see a significantly higher deployment of the vehicles because this transition uh, to uh, electric mobility or hydrogen mobility. Uh, it is as a, a, not as an alternative, but in the end of the day, it's, it's going to be a compulsion in reality, because if you really want to meet uh, net zero and you know zero objectives, I think this is going to be a significant step towards uh, uh, mitigating the CO2 emissions. India currently has roughly 22% uh, emissions coming from mobility, balance 78% comes from uh, manufacturing. So. 
out of these intercity 9 lakh buses i can say uh, definitely in the next 5 to 7 years we should be able to move to at least 10% plus yeah <clears throat> Yeah, but any reactions, Professor Geeta? Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting that uh, uh, Sulkar says, you know, intercity buses, right, is what we should uh, target initially, right? Uh, I, I agree with him there, uh, right, because I think intercity, uh, EVs may still, you know, dominate. I think intercity is where, uh, with the say distance of about 400, 500 kilometers a day. Right? I think uh, that's definitely a place where uh, hydrogen will have a uh, you know, better edge compared to electric buses, uh, right? And uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that you know with the battery buses, you know, we're carrying the dead weight, right? So when the bus is out of charge, the weight of the battery is still there, and so that's going to uh, impact. That is, that's not the case. With hydrogen, so I I kind of reflect you know what he says, but ten percent is very ambitious, <laughs> right? So I think uh, there's a lot of other See, things. Yeah, we are, huh? yeah. If you look, uh, Gita, what what the government has actually uh, said in one of its mission uh, objectives is that they want thirty percent electric mobility by two three zero. So assume that uh, these twenty lakh buses, this are currently at say around 1500 per million that is the population that is the density of buses in india but if you look at uh, what is the global average you look at countries like brazil south africa they are all at four five thousand buses per million so we are already at 40 percent of what we should be in reality and secondly the government is planning to have 30 percent electric mobility by 2030 so let us assume that out of that 80 percent will be battery electric so even if 20 percent thing i think that number will be more than one lakh buses so, yeah. I and, think uh, uh, you know, would probably be knowing, uh, yeah, significant the hydrogen think, pricing. You would be aware that uh, some of the guys, like uh, you know, electrolyzer guys like OMM and all, they have declared. Uh, I think OMM has partnered with IIT Madras also, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, they're talking are. about one dollar per, per uh, kg price. Uh, With a mileage of 15. Uh, so, uh, going back to the calculator that uh, they showed, I think one of the uh, you know biggest difference was the initial cost, uh, right? Which is about two two times two and a half times of an electric bus and about yeah, yeah. six to seven times yeah. of a diesel bus, right? I think that yeah. number is something which is going to really play uh, a big role in you know people's decision. Uh, right. So, any yeah. thoughts on that? You know, why is that such a big cost? Or, uh, how that could be brought down? See, if you look at uh, Europe, uh, typical say twelve meter bus, hydrogen bus, uh, the costing would be in the range of three and a half to four crores. So, if you take a nine meter bus costing, I think it will be somewhere in the range of three or three point two five crores. So, see, we have done ground up work, and uh, you know, we are the only company who has done develop the uh, you know fuel cell in totality from ground up. It's not the case that we imported a stack from Ballard and you know did the engineering on that, but we developed the stack completely. And currently our bus is running fine. You know the trials have actually begun. And uh, just, uh, 80, 90 percent of the supply chain here in India, I think that is a very critical uh, point of view of rolling out buses is concerned. And uh, See, ultimately, the model is going to be that some of the battery electric tenders that have come now, or I think recently, two days before, CES also, Conservation Energy Services Limited also, has come out with a tender for 5,500 buses. So they are the lead managing agency for those tenders for around five uh, cities. You know, I think Bangalore, Surat, uh, Calcutta, and few more, few more cities. They are all going to be run on GCC basis, you know, gas cost contract. So it's all going to be revenue per kilometer. So if it is going to be revenue per kilometer, on which I believe the World Bank has also advised, a very, uh, you know, they have, they have pushed uh, all the corners to ensure that this GCC model is accepted. And that is what we are seeing the result now. So I think uh, people will have to move to long distance travel with, uh, uh, you know, rate or at revenues per kilometer, uh, rupees per kilometer. And then they will have to stick to that particular model to ensure that, uh, 
you go maximum 400 500 600 kilometers on a daily basis so that your tco creeps dropping but we are pretty confident we should be able to bring the cost down below 3 crore rupees in the initial years but obviously that goes with certain volumes so those certain volumes uh, need to be really looked at yeah but uh, i believe uh, there was a pli in this uh, supreme in delhi high court so they, they have actually uh, directed the dhi department of heavy industries to issue incentives also for uh, fuel cell buses thank you mr uh... Um, Rahul, let me bring you in, um, in terms of you know, some of the questions also being asked, like what kind of policy measures do you think will make hydrogen buses viable in India? And what is the timeline that you see for the deployment of hydrogen buses in India? Any thoughts around that? Yeah, so currently... And um, if I can request you to turn on your video, that yeah, yeah. Yeah, is it there now? Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon. So, see, what I am looking uh, forward to in this hydrogen, I think this will be something which will follow the electric route. And already we are seeing a lot of, you know, STUs and government institutions coming forward for the electric. And we may, we saw CESL co coming up with a tender for 5,500 buses. And few of the CapEx purchases also happening by the STUs. Rather of late, we have seen, uh, see, what is... Uh, propelling the demand today is the higher cost of the fuel. So hydrogen from that angle today is a bit, bit distant away, I would say. And it is the cost of the diesel as well as the CNG going up by 20% in last one year, which is actually propelling the demand for zero emission, zero uh, lower cost model for the various operators and the STUs. So I think this next three, four years are more on electric and thereafter the hydrogen, if that answers the question. You see that within three years, we'll be able to switch to hydrogen. I mean, uh, there'll be- no, Minimum three, four years are for electric, as I said. And once the electric stabilizes, and then maybe it will be more of technological, uh, you know, shift, which will take which will take some time, but yes, I would, I would say that maybe three, four years, five, the development itself will take that much time, maybe more uh, for these fuels and, you know, coming up uh, commercially available availability. So, so this is minimum time frame I see. Fair enough. Yeah, Professor Gita. Yeah. So if I can just, uh, you know, come in there about uh, the policy, uh, definitely uh, without government support, we will not see you know hydrogen come up into the mainstream right in the next 10 years or so all right so there has to be a significant component of uh, subsidy right that kicks in uh, you know especially with the initial uh, you know cost of purchase right or even if it's gc right still uh, there has to be some assurance for the operators that you know over a period of time they're going to get back you know uh, the cost that they invest in initially right and there, I think uh, the government has a big role to play. Right? It's only, especially in the buses, in the sector that we're talking about, right? it's only if they come out with fairly large subsidies, right? Can uh, we see, you know, these timelines that are being quoted right, in the next 10 years or so. And uh, even there, I think what we need is perhaps for the government to have a much broader perspective, right? Uh, rather than look at things from a TCO, right? Also look at it from a social cost perspective. Okay. what will be the social costs and benefits rather than the cost, you know, the benefits that we will get as a result of moving towards net zero emissions, uh, right, will be fairly significant. What are the corresponding benefits we can get out of that? And therefore, you know, flow in more subsidy so that we realize those benefits. So that's something that we need uh, more research on, more policy analysis on. Yeah, Chandra, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, basically, in terms of the policy parameters, see, other than this initial uh, support for uh, maybe 10,000, 20,000 vehicles, you know, from the government side for the subsidy part, uh, we obviously need to look at uh, some subsidy on the fuel side also. In in that people do for, say, like electrolyzers or uh, maybe through the biomass route, because we ourselves have two techniques which are, uh, you know, based on biomass. One is Cellulosic and one is the 
uh, gasification rule. So we have recommended to the government to give 10-year tax holiday as was given in the case of solar and all. So those recommendations have been given. We also uh, dedicated biomass sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a crop to be created, which uh, we have identified. And that crop can be grown to really ensure that farmers do that. And they get additional income, which will be significantly higher than current uh, 17, 18, 20,000 rupees per acre, you know, for an average farmer. And uh, I think that will, those will be the areas which needs to be really promoted by the government. And uh, other than this, uh, uh, they need to give support in terms of, uh, you know, STU, CTU also to ensure that uh, uh, proper escrow mechanism. See, the biggest problem today is the payout. If you if somebody STU, CTU has to run the buses on, uh, uh, you know, with any private sector party coming in, because, you know, once you go to GCC model, only thing that is left is that uh, the, the manufacturer will sell the bus to the finance company and the finance or the operating company and the operating company will basically be you know operating that vehicle so, so assurance of that money on a, on a monthly basis i think through a budgetary support from the local state governments so what uh, would be a, a bit better mechanism is that you you continuously uh, do say provide uh, three months of uh, support in terms of emis which is always there in the bank account so that the escrow mechanism can actually operate in a very well uh, uh, way and you know the operators are encouraged to invest more because ultimately uh, you know their investment is going to be recovered over the next seven eight or ten years so it is not easy for anybody to look at such long-term capital deployment and uh, you know uh, long-term capital deployment at the same time uh, so much of commitment to business because you never know what can be the issues in terms of you know the battery cost the small the maintenance cost etc which because these are all all areas which are currently evolving so it will take another six eight months one year for us to really understand where would the maintenance costs would actually go. So I think these are the areas of support which uh, we feel are pretty important uh, for the government to look at. Yeah. There's a question which I thought is interesting, which is also one of the questions I had listed. And this is addressed, I think, mm -hmm. to all three of you, um, to Professor Geeta, to Mr. Mm -hmm. Jincholkar, and to, uh, to Rahul. So since we're talking about government is passing laws for better subsidies, uh, what is the general lag that is noted with respect to policy framing and implementation and um, any thoughts around that? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Um, we are government is passing laws for better subsidies. What is the general lag that is noted with respect to policy framing and implementation and what is the current status? And hydrogen, I don't think there is any uh, policies per se for buses actually right now it is more related to the national hydrogen mission which is still being developed but i know in kerala yeah, they're interested in deploying um, 10 hydrogen buses and that's something the state is exploring but other than that any other states or cities that have explored i think any initiatives rahul you want to talk about at least the uh, testing of the hydrogen fuel cell buses in india that tata motors is involved in yeah, so I would say uh, this is in the uh, pre-development development stages where, you know, the even the petroleum companies like HPCL, IUCL, and few of the STU, as you mentioned, Kerala, they are wanting to try out this option and develop this technology further. So that is, uh, that is all uh, the kind of demand which we see as on today with a with few, few of the organizations coming together to develop the new next level of technology. As you said, from the government initiatives perspective or policies perspective, yes, we are, we are currently seeing a lot of focus on the electric uh, thing. And that is what we see will, will actually continue because this also was a very, very slow starter. If we see the, in the fame one uh, scheme and then the fame two came. But uh, now with few STUs operating the electric successfully and others uh, visiting them and understanding the electric model, I think the first switchover is going to be electric. That is my view. But I was also uh, um, told that, you know, that there are some six um, hydrogen fuel cell buses that Tata Motors has developed and... Uh, yeah, we have developed. They are running in our Sanand plant. So any. I think you can talk uh, about Rahul, how many kilometers and uh, if not everything, any um, few initial observations that you have observed in terms of comparing it with diesel or hydrogen, uh, sorry, with EVs or electric buses. 
see the first challenge as i said is the availability of the fuel so while we have that with a special tie up there so that is one and the cost of the fuel then these two should make the tco like tco is the subject which we are discussing today it should make it a more viable tco for the end customer then which as on date is again as i said is under uh, let's say research and development kind of a thing for everyone the fuel companies as well as as well as the oems uh sanjay ji now that you are here and uh, welcome um, as a senior fellow at wri india and give um, given your experiences uh, in the bus space i just want to also bring in get your perspective that what do you see the viability i think there was a question also viability of hydrogen buses in india given the uh, tco challenges right now um i think earlier question was what is the timeline you think india would be ready for hydrogen buses and then of course specifically anything related to policy measures that we should be uh, we should start thinking that can go as inputs to the uh, government bodies in terms of you know thinking of a scheme for hydrogen in the near future so any perspective that you could share would be really helpful yeah uh, thanks thanks pawan and uh, good afternoon everyone so sorry for joining late uh it uh, i've coming for uh, coming back to the first question of yours about the tco analysis and how the cost of the bus can be brought down there are two three ways actually different ways when in which it can be done first of all uh, government has to support as uh, all the panelists uh, did point out that government support is key in this uh, particular area and if you remember in the fame bus scheme um of dhi there was a percentage of the bus price as the subsidy so if they can go back to that uh, 60% as the bus price um maybe that would be the good start so nothing much has to be done in this and if uh, 60% uh, bus price is subsidized then naturally you can have a very good working second is uh, maybe if fuel tax can be made in india that should be um, what government should promote and maybe they should give some pli scheme for that also because uh, many of these uh, fuel stack manufacturers are eager to come to india and in fact they are looking at the big picture so maybe it leads us to the third point wherein uh, we would expect a government to give us a clear policy on uh, uh, the numbers which can be there uh, through this subsidy for next 3 4 years so if these three things are done i am very sure the bus price will come down to somewhere around very near to the electric bus price or maybe 10 15% more than the electric bus so if you see the uh, electric vehicle as compared to this uh, fuel stack the difference would be marginal because uh, battery price will come down with fuel cell and the stack price will go goes up that is the only change which happens and maybe the cylinders so that way if you see uh, the cost price difference we should not be more than 20 30% of the electric bus price so or if these three four measures are taken i think it's very possible to get the price somewhere near 2 crores to 2.5 crores do you think 60% subsidy um, sanjay ji is that uh... possible like for how many buses ha huh, that is what actually for at least 10 to 10000 to 20000 buses first lot so if this happens i am very sure i mean for intercity application this is the best bus see right now using a electric bus for intercity doesn't make sense because you have 300 to 400 kilowatt hour battery size actually after putting that you don't have any space for the passengers so you're basically carrying your batteries only so intercity it doesn't make sense and uh, 1.5 more than 1.5 lakh uh, intercity buses are with sqs itself so these are the first ones which can be replaced immediately so i think so, i think yeah i i think even series now has posted a question which i'll come back to um, uh, but let me ask 
Dr. Guncha, that, you know, um, refueling, which I think even Professor Geeta would uh, be able to comment on, that, you know, refueling stations for hydrogen actually play a very critical mm -hmm. role in development, um, in developing a complete infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cell bus. And we're talking now about, you know, uh, putting this, um, uh, infrastructure in place to make uh, all this long haul buses that we are discussing about operation. What do you think, um, if you can share your views and perspective, what uh, will it take to get that done? And then Professor Geeta, I would also request you to comment on that because I think you were doing some refueling station exercise also on the location and how would we do the location selection and what parameters are uh, to be used that would, and any cost estimates that you could share that would be helpful. Uh, first, Dr. Guncha. Thanks, Pavan. So it's true that uh, without the widespread uh, hydrogen refueling station, this hydrogen vehicle or hydrogen fuel cell bus will strongly limit. So uh, you know, if you look at the uh, refueling station, it it will com uh, it will consist of electrolysis component if you want to produce green hydrogen, a compression system, a buffer storage system. Right, and then uh, you know dispenser system. Then we need also a pre-cooling unit. So all these uh, technical technicalities will come. Then we'll be talking about refueling station. And I believe that refueling station will uh, occupy a lot of cost thing, which which has to be uh, you know it has to be uh, solved and admit by the uh, th uh, government and by the by other organizations for. You know, for successful deployment of this hydrogen fuel cell buses. So yeah, that's thank you. So uh, before I come to Professor Geeta, Rohan, in our TCO analysis sheet uh, for refueling, what was the estimate that you used? So currently for the green hydrogen part, uh, we have used around you know 1.68 crores per bus. Uh, this is considering you know a, a 30 kg of uh, hydrogen being carried. Uh, so we are, uh, we are doing a back calculation of what is the kind of electrolyzer required this is for green hydrogen. And of course, like Kuncha mentioned, the compressors and the storage requirement. With that, the calculation that we have come up to is still around 1.68 to 1.8 crores per bus. So it's yes, it's a very significant component. And with gray, because I think uh, Kumar Abhishek is also asking that question that should we first start with gray, but just you give the cost estimates and then I'll go around the panel to say if gray hydrogen is the way to start the buses. Yeah, so for the, for the gray hydrogen, since it's not, it doesn't come through the electrolyzer process, the electrolyzer cost is sort of reduced. So it will be, you know, around 30 to 40 lakhs per bus will reduce. So we've taken around 1.05 to 1.18 crores. Uh, while uh, because the electrolyzer part is uh, is removed, we could do it through the SMR, through CCUS or not. So it's around 1.18 crores per bus, while the green hydrogen part will be around 1.5 to 1.6 crores per bus. Yeah. So Professor Geeta, coming back to you, I had uh, now two questions for you. One is, what are the parameters that need to be considered while um, selecting a refueling station? And um, so yeah, let me. Why don't you touch upon that, and then I'll come to my next question to you. Yeah, so uh, I mean, of course, I won't go into the technicalities of it because I'm not an expert there, but what uh, you know, we can look at is in terms of the routing decisions, right? So typically, you know, our bus networks, we see intercity bus networks, you have two or three hubs, and then there are multiple routes which emanate from these hubs, which go into the uh, different villages and towns, right? So if you're able to identify what these hubs are, and then if you're able to locate these hydrogen fueling stations in these hubs, all right, then we'll reduce total number of such fueling stations that are required, all right? And uh, the trade-off of course is in terms of what should be the, uh, you know, the fuel capacity that every bus can carry, you know, compared with what is the cost of setting up uh, these refueling stations. And uh, from the numbers that we initially had, you know, and none of these numbers are mine, I've just taken data that uh, we got from, you know, sources, all right, uh, that's of course that the GAZ report. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my mind. But uh, if you can look at you know the cylinder sizes, adding 30%, 40% more size uh, and not the cylinder, the cost is not that high. However, if you have to locate a new hydrogen fuel station somewhere in the hinterland, the cost of that is much higher. All right. So therefore, initially at least it makes a lot of sense to have perhaps slightly larger you know uh, cylinders to store more uh, hydrogen in the buses and then reduce the number of refueling stations that you have uh, so that the costs become manageable initially, right? But 
with i guess uh, more people adopting it there will be a economic case there will be a business case to open a lot more refueling stations in which case then you know uh, things will become uh, very different but uh, it's always the initial few years which matter and there i think we need to do careful planning that for locating these hydrogen filling stations strategically will be very important sure any comments uh, chandra or sanjay yeah uh, see i would suggest that refueling stations can be at the depots uh, stu depots because uh, normally a bus operates for 400 500 kilometers in these uh, stus most of the time and they come back to the main depot uh, after this 400 kilometer route so having a station in the depots will help a lot so you need not have a distributed uh, stations across to start with i think managing through depots the way we are doing it for electric uh, will make sense thank you sanjay yeah sanjay uh, basically sanjay raised a point about auto pli this fuel cell so if you look at the scheme which actually ended on 10th of uh, 9th of january actually uh, issued by dhi uh, they have actually given incentives for uh, fuel cell as well as various components of uh, you know electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in terms of uh, this dispensing cost hrs uh, our uh, working shows that our global uh, dialogue and discussion show that the cost can be for a two ton plant can be in the range of around uh, uh, 22 to 25 crores which effectively can suffice uh, if you require a per bus if you somebody you know uh, operator requires at 25 kg of hydrogen it will suffice for around 80 buses so if, if effectively it will be in the range of 30 35 lakh rupees per uh, per bus uh, but obviously with volume that cost will come down significantly uh, as we are seeing electrolyzer cost have also started coming down significantly i think omi is quoting significantly lower price so if that happens i think uh, over a period of time uh, in the next few to four years i think the cost will come down significantly from a hydrogen production point of view and dispensing point of view and uh, more important as uh, uh, you know tata's have actually won that iucl tender even the the, I, the ntpc tender is also now currently open and they have requested for bids by around i think 7th or 8th of uh, february so with this uh, i think the volume for buses will also go up so we are hopeful that uh, in the coming days more uh, and uh, you know there there are def definitely different large number of inquiries in terms of uh, hydrogen buses obviously everybody is looking at the cost coming down and uh, who goes first but obviously the government has to support and you know we should need to start somewhere so that uh, those operational data are available for anybody to see and you know how benefits can be derived from that i think it is very important yeah thank you yeah professor gita yeah so a uh, good point you know uh, i think at you know current efficiencies we talk about you know 11 12 kilometers per kilogram of hydrogen right? so at that kind of efficiencies you know maybe at 25 uh kilograms of you know, storage is not going to be sufficient so i think we need to look at 40 60 right that's the range especially if you're talking about uh, intercity buses right so uh, you have it in one depot but then it makes a trip out and then it has to come back right so till it comes back you need to have sufficient uh, fuel in it, right and then there is this range anxiety so you need to add that extra 10 15% and then there is a deterioration over time that's also possible right so we need to factor all of that and then i think the the size of these tanks have to be you know i i believe for intensity 40 to 60 kg size tank is what you know is required sure um i'll just pick up some questions from um, what audience have um, um, listed so i think uh, polash um, good to hear from you from csl is asking um do you think that a demand aggregation gcc model with support of subsidy could be a solution for initial deployment uh, for um, the hydrogen buses because i know cfl is doing some similar thing similar for electric buses and they've opened the grand challenge uh, last week uh, uh, it was floated so any thoughts around that sanjay ji and it's open ended uh, we have another 15 20 minutes so please feel free to jump in and you know uh, uh, share your response but yeah sanjay why don't we start with you so yes uh, gcc something of uh, similar to ev will surely help for fuel buses and that is the way we can start actually in big numbers otherwise you will always see 10 or 50 numbers coming and that will not actually make lot of sense in 
um, I mean, it will it will be a very slow start if it happens otherwise. So G GCC and uh, through CESL, we can do big numbers. And uh, the only challenge would be to get the infrastructure in place for charging, uh, for fueling. So that is the only challenge which is there. Otherwise, uh, we can have, uh, in fact, uh, as fast as uh, electric buses. And even the uh, fuel intercity buses are more in numbers. So the adoption could be much faster. But um, this is uh, assuming that OEMs are okay doing this, isn't it? Because we are assuming in GCC that someone is going to put the upfront cost. But let me ask um, Rahul and uh, Chandra, I'm putting you a little bit on the spot, but is GCC the model to really uh, look for deployment of hydrogen buses? Yeah, this will be, uh, there's no doubt on that. GCC will be first thing and first promoter, but as I said, uh, hydrogen is something a uh, bit more complex today than the electric, under development, R&D, a lot of things getting into. And this will take some time to actually take off from where it is today, because hydrogen as a gas is also, you know, is a, is, handling hydrogen is also a challenge today. So a lot of infrastructure, policy making, and then uh, a lot of investments from oil companies as well as the OEMs is what needs to get into today to take this off, including the GCC. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, the GCC model can work very well. We need to have at least initial uh, 1500 buses uh, at one go uh, in one particular tender so that we are able to see some volume. I think this particular model uh, can actually, you know, be developed, uh, say, region-wise. You know, you can probably look at or, or center-wise, say, 100 buses plus uh, you know, HRS, and then you can look at running those buses for 400 kilometers on a daily basis, for 500 kilometers on a daily basis. So I think those those kind of models, uh, because typical 100 buses with uh, HRS and everything can definitely, uh, uh, with some support from the uh, central government as well as the state government, because a lot of uh, state governments are also given subsidy for electric vehicles, so they'll probably give some subsidy for uh, hydrogen vehicles also. So I think those kind of regional models development I think is a way forward so that people are able to see the data, they're able to see the benefits. And I think GCC can definitely work in this uh, particular area. There's also a question that Kumar Abhishek had uh, asked that um, given that hydrogen fuel contributes heavily towards TCO, uh, we are very clear that the um, government is saying that it should be a green hydrogen based uh, policy, but in mobility, um, and this is to all my panelists that, you know, do you think gray hydrogen uh, based refilling stations is the way to start? Uh, or do you think that transition later to green would become very difficult? Any thoughts around that? Uh, Professor Geeta, why don't I I'll start with you? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's easier that way, uh, right? But, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think that's only way. Right? If you talk about even electric vehicles, right? We are uh, diving headlong into you know, electric buses and electric cars and two wheelers. That is, you know, uh, about 50, 60 percent of the production is still from, you know, coal, all right? Maybe higher. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, that's the way we will start off with, right? It's not the ideal way, but uh, that's how it's going to pan out. Like, I don't think, uh, you know, there is any other option. But of course, for pilot projects, we can definitely, you know, uh, look at uh, subsidies and you know more green hydrogen production plants being set up, especially for pilot projects. And so that can be good to showcase. But when you talk about mass market, I think again the next five to ten years at least it's going to be grey hydrogen, which is going to dominate. I don't think uh, green hydrogen will be anywhere cost competitive compared to grey hydrogen. Yeah. Any thoughts there, uh, Guncha? Well, it's true, actually, you know, green hydrogen is costly, but, uh, you know, this is the only way out, you know, sooner or later, we'll sh we all, all of us will shift to green hydrogen only. So presently, only 5% of hydrogen is produced from electrolysis, otherwise, most of it by steam methane deforming and coal gasification. But over the period of time, it will be the electrolysis, which will be taking part majorly all over the world for producing hydrogen. So, yeah. So green hydrogen is the only answer. 
so but is gray the first option to start with i don't uh, matlab the thing is that if we produce gray hydrogen then with every 1 kg of hydrogen you produce 9 9 kg of co2 then what's the point of doing this hydrogen fuel cell bus all together you know you are producing co2 at refueling stations and not producing on the roads so you know so why not to start with green hydrogen only if you, if the main motto is to clean the clean our country so yeah that's it so any thoughts there uh, because i think um, i hear your perspective um, uh, guncha but the question is also about um you know the technology readiness and the need to test it's not that green, green hydrogen is readily available to run all these buses so um chandra moving to you what would you really uh, suggest uh, think uh, initially i think uh, for the first uh, one or two years we you will have to look at gray as an option and uh, you know green hydrogen actually comes uh, or uh, gets produced in a significant way because india has uh, more than 15000 kilometers of you know lng pipeline so at least that distribution model is available today for us to really look at producing hydrogen there through uh, last mile uh, you know smr process i think one should begin with uh, uh, gray hydrogen start running on the the buses and then slowly clear mandate that this uh, uh, these operators or these uh, users will start uh, shifting to green hydrogen next so i think that that approach will probably help in terms of uh, you know compelling compelling them to you know move to green hydrogen yeah sanjay and then rahul yes i also agree that uh, most of the panel that uh, start has to be done with gray only we can't wait for the green to be there and then we start because there are a lot of things to be done infrastructure has to be set up there has to be learning as you rightly said technology has to be developed uh, localization has to be done so all that can start with gray hydrogen and later on uh, like even in electric we are actually slowly moving we would slowly move to solar also so but then that will take time so we can't stop the development process and wait for the green hydrogen to be there to start the process when finally rahul yeah i i agree i agree with what uh, sanjay sir told so it would be it would be similar uh, approach uh, start with gray and then you know keep developing and moving towards the greener part i think some of the attendees have uh, suggested that uh, it shouldn't be but moving on um, shirish has been asking this question right where he said that a uh, french city recently cancelled hydrogen bus procurement stating subsidies were there for capex but opex part is more challenging so any um, thoughts around that that uh, the uh, operations of hydrogen buses is quite unknown to many of us in fact i also <laughs> i only have heard and you know most of us probably don't even know how you know the what are the operational aspects that are needed honestly um, admitting it here but any thoughts around that that how do we address these challenges i think specifically like chandra i'll start with you i mean you have demonstrated yeah. a bus so i think you'll have to tell yeah. us what are the operational challenges that you see can will come up and how it will be addressed see yeah, if you look at the opex part uh, you know major component is obviously the cost of hydrogen you know so but then that can be in a way addressed uh, some amount of you know dedicated biomass generation and converting that into green hydrogen and some carbon credits being given to the farmers or the community which develops that is one one way to look at it second is other other aspects or initial cost of the uh, uh, you know initial cost of the maintenance also which is still not known from the hydrogen point of view because at least battery electric we have been running uh, so many buses so we are have clarity on the operation on the maintenance part so maintenance is also one area which is going to be of uh, challenging scenario uh, in the in the coming years i think if we are able to address these two particular aspects i think we are we should be able to have a, a opex cost which can be you know we bring it down to significantly lower level obviously the innovation part needs to really happen so that we are able to you know get the cost of green hydrogen down so i think people like comium then i think reliance is also talking about uh, 1 dollar 1 by 10 in the next 10 years dollar 1 per kg 
so these are the uh, these are the uh, you know people or the corporates who are very serious about it and one needs to look at how they can be supported or you know how government can support this entire initiative to ensure that the nitrogen cost per kg actually can come down and obviously improvement in terms of the mileage you know from a uh, we currently see a mileage of around around 14 to 15 but it can obviously go to 18 to 20 left so i think uh, this is a uh, question related to that which chakrapani has posed in the q and a what is the range we can get for 1 kg of hydrogen at 350 bar versus 700 bar so any of the panelists if you are aware if you can answer that question <clears throat> So, Chandra, you gave only. I can I can comment. Uh, say, uh, you know, we, our current trials, uh, it's in the range of fourteen to fifteen, and obviously, uh, uh, the hydrogen is filled at little lower pressure than three fifty. So, because we are getting it from some other sources, uh, other industrial sources. So, uh, I don't. I am difficult to comment. Say, what will be the uh, mileage at three fifty or seven hundred bar? But. Uh, at the current pressure levels that we have and i think it is in the range of 200 to 250 bar we are able to get that mileage of 14 to 15 and i think as things improve maybe we will be able to you know better things and as our trials happen we will be have much more data on hand to really comment on that in a much better way anyone who wants to add anything to this any information or idea you have related to the pressure bar and um. well for uh, light duty vehicles like for vehicle passengers uh, 700 bar so it is a uh, 100 km per kg so normally this is uh, what uh, youtube videos tell about toyota and hyundai so this is what they this figure is what they see for uh, small duty vehicles okay 100 km per kg is a big number actually yeah it's almost seven times of what you are saying um, chandra uh, that's light duty right that's cars <laughs> Ah, uh, sorry, light duty cars. So it's okay. not uh, buses, but still, that's a very high number. I mean, our literature has shown numbers of order of twelve, eleven to twelve kilometers per kilogram. <laughs> okay, and uh, Vishal has been asking, which is I thought is an interesting question, and. Um, that do we also consider the possibility of retrofitting existing buses with hydrogen is that something anyone has thought about or talked about is that possible actually because i think we are talking about a completely different setup right so i think that we are talking about using hydrogen as a fuel directly as a you know the fuel cell idea right so i think uh, i'm not seeing demonstrations of that yet Uh, see, we we have been party to these uh, BEV retrofit equipment standards also, and now uh, BEV uh, you know works well, but obviously hydrogen part no one has really tried. So that is a question uh, or that is a challenge we all of us need to really take it up. Interesting, and um, I think Kiran is uh, co- has commented saying that retrofitting battery buses with fuel cell might be possible. any thoughts around that i think we should not go that route you know uh, the cost of you know the hydrogen fuel cell that is which is high end right? so i don't think it's like the major part we are anyway investing in only the minor part we are trying to uh, say so i don't think uh, that's the best route to do it and i think the safety standards are also very different uh, so there's an interesting yeah. comment i thought i'll read from kumar he says that um, um whether market will think differently on hydrogen transport one year from now on long distance once tesla's uh, long distance trucks come out um, can battery advances like energy density gains uh, with solid state um, and the other li batteries kill hydrogen transport together i mean i just want to hear as a thought what do you see we see so many technologies being talked about we are talking about aluminium mayer and then you know we are saying that you know with super capacitors to improve in the ev cell now with hydrogen um where do you think that as the india we should be uh, at least specifically from the mobility and let's only focus on mobility that we should be focusing on i think this is the last question i'll take up professor geeta let me start with you like given that there are so many technologies what do you think we should be doing 
So <laughs> this is pretty much crystal ball gazing, uh, right? So uh, you know, definitely, uh, I think we should look at alternatives. See, carrying such a huge battery is not efficient. Right? That's that's my, especially for long distance travel, right? So a better technology is you know using those uh, pantographs, right? Basically having those overhead lines, you know, something that could be explored uh, for long distance, you know, highway based transportation, right? So that's something perhaps that's much more competitive. Uh, I would say to hydrogen rather than talking about having, you know, one ton batteries being carried, right? So uh, that's that's my thought. But uh, you know, uh, none of us know the future. I think, uh, but it's good to create some kind of a level playing field for all these options so that they can fight it out, all right? And then we see whichever is the best technology that emerges. Uh, also, you need to have a kind of ecosystem for any of these to take off, right? So the government should look to create that initial ecosystem, give everybody you know, that level playing field from where they can compete and see what emerges uh, as the best option, right? Uh, one other point, you know, uh, out of time, I just want to mention, right? That French city, uh, though it had good intentions, has done a lot of harm to the case of hydrogen. Everybody is quoting that, you know, the French city moved from hydrogen to electric, hydrogen to electric, right? So I think that's something that we have to be careful about. Many of us start with good intentions and it doesn't uh, give us the right benefit. The same way, you know, your TCO calculator will now be used to show how hydrogen buses are three times more expensive <laughs> than you know, diesel buses. So uh, we start with the good you know, intention, but uh, doesn't quite work out uh, as you know, we anticipate, right? So I know that's a word of caution that I just wanted to put out. So thanks for bringing that. I think that same thing happened uh, when BRT was launched in Delhi, right? That, um, and for many reasons, how it was, and you know, it became like BRT will not work in India at all. And of course, in Ahmedabad, it did make work, and we saw how it would became a very difficult conversations in other uh, metropolitan. Yeah, Chandra, over to you. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> see few clues from my side. Uh, I think Rohan mentioned about this cost per kilowatt. In terms of our own research uh, and our, our own effort of building up the ground of vehicle, uh, we are pretty confident when the number of buses actually cross uh, 800 to 1000, we should be able to bring the uh, cost per kilowatt down to uh, say less than $600. So from a current level of $1,500, I think at least, at least in India, we should be able to bring it down to that level. And with more volumes, I think uh, uh, the, the cost will definitely come down. DOE has a very high target there. They're talking about less than $250 per kilowatt at, say, 25,000 buses or something like that. So they have a pretty huge number. Uh, so one has to look at in terms of uh, bus and the cost of kill, you know, the fuel cell ultimately coming down so that we are able to more, uh, move towards uh, Penetration in hydrogen. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rahul? Yeah, so maybe, see, this is something which is too early to comment, but yeah, the technology, anyhow, we have to, <coughs> we have to invest, we have to research, and we are doing all, 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 all the time. And, and yes, uh, we will see how it evolves over, over the period, how things change, the economy changes, and if there is some kind of a, some kind of a, you know, uh, move towards some government policies, infra development, everybody contributes. Yes, it should move on. That is our view. Thank you, Ron. Sanjay Ji, Guncha, quick uh, thoughts, multiple technologies, multiple approaches, what should we be doing? Oh, well, it will be very interesting to see how the technology shift takes place in next 10, 20 years. We are looking forward to it. So more of a witness and observer. <laughs> Any predictions here, Sanjay ji? I think we should try it out before actually commenting anything. Because until unless we try it out in India, we will not be able to uh, comment on it. So it's better we try out with few hundred vehicles. Yeah. No, fair enough. I think on that note, uh, let me uh, end this um, webinar panel and um, you know the TCO launch. Congratulations, Rohan and team on this. I think the tool, as Professor Geeta mentioned, is not to show that uh, should not be <laughs> seen as you know how uh, hydrogen cannot work today. I think we all understand that, but it is also about looking at what kind of 
policy measures would be needed in terms of subsidies and how do we really start looking at it given um, in the near future so in fact if you're interested in exploring with the tool would request you to send an email to rohan.rao at wri.org and um, play with the tool and please share your feedback and the hope is uh, also to just start a conversation in this um, mobility space on the applications of hydrogen and hopefully we have had some i would say interesting discussions um, and some parameters and some understanding still needs to evolve and i think all the panelists we all recognize that and i think there was already an acknowledgement that we are not an experts everyone knowing everything so that's good but let me thank everyone professor geeta uh, um, chandra thank you so much for joining from kpit rahul from tata motors sanjay ji and guncha from wri and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon have a wonderful weekend thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you everyone um anand if we can copy the questions from the q and a and also from the chat i think we can take it up and we can stop the recording uh...